from Electrocraft. Welcome to Room Tone. My name is William Garrett. The Room Tone for today's conversation comes from Electrocraft East, my studio in New York City. Today's Room Tone is altered by composer and musician Pat Irwin. After college, Pat spent a year in Paris as a journalist interviewing jazz musicians and also attending composition workshops with the composer John Cage. Moving to New York in the late 70s, he was a founding member of two influential bands of the no-wave scene, Eight-Eyed Spy and the Ray Beats. He then joined and toured the world with new wave hitmakers, the B-52s. All the while, Pat was composing music for film, television, dance companies, and more. From the hit cartoon Rocco's Modern Life to Showtime's dark comedy drama Nurse Jackie, Pat's music details the action and sets the mood. In addition to his musical achievements, he once again has embraced journalism, recently writing for the New York Times Book Review. Pat has been my friend and neighbor for many years. I've been lucky to join him as a collaborator on many projects. In our Room Tone conversation, we talk about growing up in the Midwest and playing early gigs at places with names like The Beef and Barrel, the trip to France that changed his life, a three-week gig with the B-52s that lasted 18 years, and playing a pine cone with iconic composer John Cage. Hey, well, welcome, Pat. Thanks for coming by to have a chat. Good to see you. <laughs> Let's start with your hometown, your family, and the influences that led you to pursue a creative life. Um, did creativity come early? And if it did, or when it did, were you encouraged or discouraged to follow through with your creative impulses? I think I would say it came fairly early. Um, there was always music in the air, and it was a great time for music. You know, um, it was on television, it was on radio. Radio was changing, music was changing, and I loved what I heard. You know, whether that would be the Beatles on Ed Sullivan or the soundtrack to Goldfinger or you know whatever record you know was just rock and roll was like changing quickly where where'd you grow up it would be the midwest i lived in uh suburban chicago um i remember buying my first cream record at the target when we lived in minnesota there was a target back in those days Oh, yeah, that's where it started. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. I thought that was a relatively new thing. As far as encouragement, I would say that it was a little bit of both. It was, I was never discouraged, although, you know, I would say when it came time for me to, uh, I don't know whether I would say even made a decision. It just kind of evolved. But when it became clear that this is what I was going to do, with my life, it wasn't a smooth road of encouragement. I can I can certainly relate to that because uh, parents of a certain generation would have assumed that this was not a uh, a positive career choice. Do you remember a point of picking up your first instrument, or you know, did you take lessons when you were young? Yeah, I took clarinet lessons. Yes, I remember you played clarinet on a film score for me a long time ago. Yeah, and uh, I still love that instrument. But once I started to uh, hear the Beatles, it was time to get a guitar. That's amazing that in talking to friends, the Beatles is a big turning point for a lot of us. And I always joke with my father that he brought home Meet the Beatles as a present. So if he um, you know, ever thought I shouldn't pursue music, I said, well, you know, it's your fault. You brought that <laughs> record home. And, uh, and any playing with other people early on in terms of bands and things like that? Or were you just sort of a solitary picker? I, I, I played music with other people often. Mm -hmm. um, school band? I mean, like, with, with clarinet, obviously you weren't playing in a rock band, so you were playing with a school band or orchestra or something like that? Yeah, I played in the school orchestra, but by the time I was in junior high, I was playing with uh, some kind of older rock and roll guys. Still on clarinet, or had you moved no, to guitar I, at this point? at that point I was playing piano. Oh, piano, still. right. I played... Uh, 
by that time you would have even called them oldies. It would it was, but it was like a lesson in older rock and roll. Um, you know, pre-Beatles music, but I, I was young. I was in junior high, and so that I started to play in uh, the Ramada Inn. I was just going to ask what the venues were. I think we all have a good Ramada Inn story. My mom remembers a uh, uh, remembering a time when I played this place called the Beef Inn Barrel. <laughs> <laughs> the Beef Inn. I, it's N with an apostrophe yeah, barrel, right, of course. Exactly. Yeah. And peanuts on the floor. Nice. And... Um, I was being heckled, and my band, uh, and I must have been in high school, but we did not get asked back. <laughs> the one the one night stand at the Beef and Barrel. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Then as you approached college time, were you thinking of music at that point? No, I. that's when it um, the discouraging road began to bubble up a little bit more, and I, I played music, but I wasn't really thinking of it. As my life, I, I just went. I went to college. Right. I was going to college, but I played over the summers. And what did it look like? You were going to be studying in college? Oh, anything other than music. <laughs> um, uh, you know, English, American literature, American history. So, tell me about your time at Grinnell, and then the Watson Fellowship that took you to Paris after that. Oh well, that um, that was what did it. That was a big deal. I had a proposal that I was going to. I was a big fan of jazz. And I still mm-hmm. am. And I was going to investigate and interview American expatriate jazz musicians in Europe. The long tradition of that. And and I did that. So you applied to the fellowship in more of a journalistic capacity in yeah. terms of going there to interview and, and look at the jazz scene in Paris. Mm-hmm. And I did write an article or two. Great. Um, but uh, I interviewed uh, Dexter Gordon, Steve Lacey, Mal Waldron, but it didn't last very long. I, 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 How long were you there? I, I was there a year. Fantastic. But a little over a year. I had a great apartment. It was great. <laughs> um, and I got to know real musicians, real working musicians. And um, I learned fairly quickly that uh, I didn't want to be a writer. I wanted to be a musician. Now, and were you composing anything at this point in time or writing music? No. Not uh, yet? Not not yet, no. Right. But the experience there really turned you around to wanting to uh, be a full-time musician. Absolutely. And it was at that point where I, was, I, I didn't have a choice. Editor insert. As usual, when the interview ended, the chat continued and Pat told me another great story about his time in Paris that I didn't want to leave out. He kindly recorded this insert at his studio a few weeks later. One of the most remarkable experiences I've ever had was while I was living in Paris, I had the opportunity to work with the singular composer, John Cage. I didn't even know if I was going to pursue music. I, of course, knew who Cage was, but I think I'm still sorting out his influence and impact. He heard music and beauty everywhere, He was giving a composition workshop at the American Center, and a few of us lucky ones got to attend. The workshops ended with a performance of the piece that we were all composing based on random chance strategies, and we were throwing the I Ching, and it was pretty pretty crazy and far out. If I'm remembering it correctly, I played a pine cone. Cage had total conviction in his work. He was completely focused and disciplined. I'll never forget it. I think about it all the time. Did you come directly back from uh, Paris to New York? Or, mm-hmm. uh-huh. I moved right back here. And What year was that that you came to New York for the first time? Uh, well, To live, I guess. To live. I, I stopped in on my way out in seven, the end of 77, 1977, and I came back in 1979. And then once you got here, what was your path in terms of getting involved with other musicians? You know, you're equated with some of these bands from the so-called no-wave scene, did it just sort of happen, or did you pursue certain people you wanted to make music with? I'd have to say that it, it was a little of both. It, it Had that scene sort of already begun? Or, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so there were bands that you liked, and so you were drawn toward them. Yeah, the contortions and uh, DNA 
and Teenage Jesus had um, and Mars had done an album with Brian Eno that was just coming out called No New York. Hmm. Which, and is that where the term no wave comes from or was it already there before? It was a little of that. Right. It was kind of in the air. It was very sort of, you know, the the first punk new wave thing, which I would say would be Blondie, Talking Heads, Television, Ramones, Patti Smith, was just breaking out onto a national level. I mean, th- they were big stars right. as far as I was concerned, B-52s. Mm-hmm. And um, this other kind of scene was just kind of taking over playing you know the same sort of venues it was generating a lot of press and attention Mm -hmm. and i had a mutual friend who introduced me to uh, george who was george scott who Mm -hmm. was in the contortions right and he was friends with lydia lunch and they wanted to form a band and we did and that band was called eight-eyed spy so that was pre the ray beats it was right not by much but it was and And, and you were playing guitar in eight-eyed spy or um, yes, and saxophone. And saxophone, right? And it it lasted a hot minute. You know, it was a <laughs> it was a quick quick year. We toured cra- like crazy people. So there was a there was a market outside New York City for that. I wouldn't exaggerate it, right? But, but we could we could play. That's cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that was like the beginning of this second wave, alternative wave of of a scene. You know, of of. Bands that ne- weren't necessarily, uh, we didn't have much in common musically, but we were friends, uh, whether it was the DBs or the Bongos, um, even REM. You know, we'd be playing the same places up and down the East Coast and the West Coast. So that scene became your first musical community and the first place where you got the real life of the touring, hardworking musician. Yeah. For better or for worse. Yeah, there were some... <laughs> uh, there were some there were some touring things that I would not want to repeat. <laughs> I'm sure. But we spent a lot of time on the road. Eight Eye Spy lasted for a hot minute, as you said, and then the Ray Beats were next? Yeah, but they, they overlapped. Right, some um, mutual members, right? Right, mutual members. And um, Don Christensen and Jody Harris were in the contortions with George. So the four of us all loved instrumental rock and roll and it was George and Don really put it together the idea to have an instrumental band but what's interesting about it the more I think back is that um, hip-hop was just starting to happen and 12-inch dance records were in the air and George was working at a a record store down the street here called the Musical Maze and people were coming in and asking for some of these records that were just starting to Hmm. happen it was a thrilling time but they would be some of them were made on like like apache like a like like an instrumental by the um, i think it was the amazing bongo band or something like that and george was like i know that song (laughs) and he thought if we formed an instrumental band we could be part of that kind of scene and wow interesting so Early hip hop stuff was sampling instrumental music from the '60s. I guess that's where Apache would be from, right? Yeah, it wasn't the original version of Apache. Oh, I see. They were making new. But it, no, well, it was a it was a the amazing bongo band. I don't know when that record was made, but that was one of the first really big samples. I mean, right. you heard it everywhere. It was just in the air, and there were other uh, Scorpio by Dennis Coffey. There were other, of course, Chic. Um, and it, it, the whole idea was that just basically there were these long instrumental grooves, and what was sort of fun. I mean, it was just in the air, right? And it was a great time to be playing music in New York. But that's interesting, you know. You, I wouldn't just offhandedly connect the, you know, beginnings of the Ray Beats with the beginnings of hip hop at the same time. So that's a very interesting connection. Yeah, it was. Um, I, I wouldn't overstate that connection but that right. was kind of the, the the one of the ideas of the band it wasn't that we we're just going to be i mean it was it was thought out by george who <laughs> was quite a character that's very cool the music from that time as you were saying it was a great time to play and be in new york but seems to have had sort of a lasting influence over indie bands that are coming out you know came out in the 90s coming out now and um, did everybody sort of know what they were doing or is it was everybody just doing what came naturally and that's what happened it was just natural right it wasn't 
wasn't calculated at all. Oh, no. No, hardly. I mean, and, and there were clearly some bands that had a little more business sense than, than we did. Right. And I, I admire that, you know, the people that have a, a kind of a natural business sense as well. I mean, right. if they don't have the business sense, they make sure they find someone who does have it. Well, that certainly helps in the creative community for somebody to have a business. Head. Yeah, yeah. But it's it, rare. <laughs> yeah, it's handy. So the Ray Beats ran their course. We ran our course. Uh, it was uh, not a sprint there at the end. <laughs> um, but it was time for us to end. Right. And we were all doing other things also. Um, I was writing music had met choreographers and i was collaborating with choreographers so you're um, moving a little bit out of the rock and roll genre and writing for other things absolutely and i've always been interested in that and and uh started to do it at that time there were performance artists that i was working with i worked with a theater company but you know at that time all you know the ray beats said we had done shows with the b-52s right and we were also playing the same venues, whether it be Max's Kansas City, the Mud Club, or CBGB's up in New York, Hurrah, or up and down the, you know, along the East Coast playing the exact same places. Right. And so we would run into each other all the time. Some story about how you lent them a guitar amp one night and that's how it all got started? Well, uh, that's when I met um, a couple of them officially. I... Well, I was living a block behind the Mud Club at that time. I had moved from the Flower District, and I was down on Franklin. There was an alley, and I lived at the end of the alley. I, I remember that alley. I, we, uh, with Rubber Rodeo, we played the Mud Club toward the end of its reign, and uh, I remember that whole scene there. It was pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. And I don't recall what um, the circumstances were. I think it was the bees' manager at the time. Maureen um, contacted me. Uh, they needed an amplifier. And through that, I remember meeting Kate, who we stayed in contact with. And what was that experience like going from, I guess the B-52s were already incredibly established at that point, right? In one way, but in, in another way, they were starting over. Uh, that is not wholly accurate, but it felt like that. The, the, there wasn't a record. A record was being made, which had Love Shack on it in Rome. Rock Lobster had been a hit at this point in time, right? Huge. They yeah. were big stars. Yeah. I love that band. You know, that was just one of my favorite bands. Mm -hmm. And um, they had, uh, they would run their course. Right. They didn't really think they were going to uh, continue after Ricky died. Right. But... They decided to, they started to make some new songs, which were great. K Keith was writing some phenomenal things. They had finished the record, and they needed a band. Uh, Sarah Lee had played on it, and uh, Sarah, Zach, and I started to, to play with the band, and we were only going to go out on the road for three weeks. I see, so it was just this back line that was created of Sarah Lee, Zach, what's Zach's last name? Alfred. Zach, uh, and you was just put together for a three-week tour to back up some new material. Yeah. And then it carried on for a very long time. That first tour was 18 months long. Wow. So it just never stopped. It didn't stop. <laughs> well, that must have been really exciting for you, though, you know, playing with one of your favorite bands and being on the road, again, falling into that working musician world that you were interested in. Well, it was on another level. Yeah. It was it was thrilling. Right. And, and you know what's so cool is... You know that the music was so positive, and how many people loved that band? Right, that was really fun, and of course, we were. You know, the audience was growing, but there was a real loyal, like you said, they were. They had, you know, a following from before. And how long did you stay in the band? Um, I I lose track, but I I, you know, eighteen years. Right. So from three weeks. To 18 years, so that's a pretty good stretch. Yeah, that was quite a run. And you must have played some amazing shows. I know I've been at a couple of them, and they were great. Yeah, it was fun. They were great. Now, when did your move into doing stuff for television and film happen? Um, in the mid-'80s, I, I had done a performance at Dance Theater Workshop 
I, I collaborated with a choreographer named Stephen Petronio, and then um, a couple other choreographers, Pouquet uh, was one of them, mm-hmm. Victoria Marks, and a couple of those pieces got reviewed in the Times. Nice. And a producer from Turner Broadcasting read one of the reviews. And usually when they do a dance piece, they don't, sometimes they don't mention the music. So luckily you were mentioned in these reviews specifically. Yeah, and then that led to a concert of my own music at Dance Theater Workshop and some other places. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah. And the Turner Broadcasting guy was just interested in general or put you directly on to a specific show? They had me write, uh, they said, why don't you come down and write the score for some of these documentaries? Great. What were what were some of the original documentaries you do? This is so you come down meaning go down to Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah. And it do was it and great. do and do it down there. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Been, that <laughs> must have been quite a difference from being in New York. So. Yeah, I was in like a hotel room, and then I would go to. I mean, I've never really ever done anything like that since. Wow. It was like come down, work on the spot, and then that's it. Like like sit at the piano and just create. Yeah, it was a Sinclair. <laughs> wow, well, that's that's a very expensive piano. Yeah, it was an instrument I didn't know how to use at all. Right there, I remember using those and needing a guy to show me how to use it. Buttons yeah. and discs. I mean, it was, it was uh, insane, uh, cra- crazy. But um, it was a it was a good experience, and I I did two or three three I believe documentaries for Turner Broadcasting. Were they serious subject matter or sharks and whales or what kind of stuff? Oh man, it was serious. It, one, they were. Uh, produced in collaboration with the UN, so I remember wow. there being, you know, release parties at the United Nations, and and um, you know, one was about the population of the the, the world was surpassing five million people at the time. There was a another environmental documentary. I've forgotten the names of them, but they were, you know, the, Turner Broadcasting had a very robust, if you will, documentary kind of. Um, Department. Wow, interesting. And that led they, and then that led to a couple other things later. But. Mm-hmm. And then when did Rocco's Modern Life come into play? Was that the first cartoon that you had scored? Yes. Yeah, and yeah. that was extremely popular and well received. Yeah, that was a gas. Did that move you into sort of cartoon guy world for a bit, or for a minute? Yeah, I did Rocco's Modern Life, which was that was great, it, fun. That was just life the way it ought to be. Um, and it was not easy because I was also in the B-52s at the time. So I had to write while I was on the road and record around the different schedules of everyone. But you were using mostly all live musicians. Right, at this all point. live right, musicians, right, yeah. Which is fantastic. For both that and then the one after that, which was called... Uh, uh, Rocco's Modern Life was on Nickelodeon. Right. And um, the next one was Pepper Ann, which was on Disney. I remember that was Disney slash ABC, so that right. was a good thing. And that lasted a couple of years, right? Four or five years. Four or five years. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Tell me about your creative process, and do you have a, a typical palette of sounds and a musical vocabulary that you sort of stick with? I mean, I know that you're the king of the twang guitar, among other things, but do you start from sort of a general palette of sounds or, or just completely redo that every time you look at something new you have to score well i mean i think the first time i met with the director um and the showrunner of nurse jackie which i'm working on now he said it's got to be a guitar but it's not twangy (laughs) and you said what was your response to that one (laughs) how is that possible well it's fine i mean i was you know happily pushed into another direction i i find that i've been writing music for small ensembles not you know they're like the cartoon for it would be six seven eight nine musicians Mm -hmm. kind of based around a rhythm section but you know it's also really you know i'd heard lots of music with in the you know while in new york by philip glass and steve reich and uh, others and even Glenn Branca, which they were just making ensembles out of unique combinations of instruments, whether it's percussion or organs, and I would kind of draw on that as well. Right, because I remember 
on things we worked on together. Vibes is always omnipresent, marimba, different kinds of percussion, mm -hmm. different kinds of synthesizers, so which would be similar to that same kind of combination that, mm -hmm. that uh, Philip Glass or Steve Reich might use, mm -hmm. but a lot more fun. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> a little bit less repetitive, so that's maybe. good. It may be just a little bit. The film and TV world is so competitive and political. How do you navigate all that? I know you and I have had conversations about just in general how difficult our business is and all that, but it seems uh, seems like you've done a good job at, at sort of navigating all the possible pitfalls. Thanks. <laughs> but, you know, it just, it's just keep going. I mean, you know, I, I'm not so sure that I'm an expert at navigating it, but I know that I kind of stay away from the political competitive side of it. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't keep up on it. I'm aware, you know, of other people who are doing other things and I know they're aware of me. I mean, so often we're all up against each other for the same jobs. Right. It's too hard to be that competitive. Yeah, I think so. I think it wears you out. I've always been impressed by the way you seem to just let things be, and if you get something, you get it. If you don't, you move on to the next thing, which is, is sometimes difficult yeah. to do, is it's a livelihood. It's pretty amazing to roll through all that stuff and still survive. Yeah, it's, it, it's uh, to be honest with you, part of the job now. Right. There's no doubt about it. Because it's such a limited group of people that are doing it and such an amazingly huge amount of people who want to be doing it. Well, yeah, and there's more and more people doing it. Right. You know, then there's some that are just great, doing great, great things. Well, it's nice to admire the people that are working around you in the same world. Um, we were talking before we started doing the interview today about something new you're working on, which is writing book reviews for the New York Times. It's a very interesting parallel back to the story you told about heading to Paris as a young man to uh, interview and write about jazz musicians. What brought you back to journalism? Well, the, uh, it was the editor of the book review contacted me, um, and uh, it was it was fun. I did I did two reviews. One was on a uh, uh, a book that had been written about the uh, Talking Heads, and so I it was a it was a time and a that I knew about mm -hmm. and a record. It was about the record of Fear of Music. So I wrote about that book by Jonathan Latham. And then uh, the other one was on the Rolling Stones. And, um, you know, the B-52s had opened for the Rolling Stones, which had given me just a little window, a slightly different window into that band than just a fan. Right. You were on the other side of the fence. Uh, well, kind of. Maybe, maybe at a different place yeah, yeah. along the fence. I was going to say, yeah, there was a different fence yeah, once yeah. you got over that first fence. <laughs> we got yeah. past the first fence, yeah. And that was another one, but yeah, I was in between the but fences. But you were there. You were closer than yeah. most, right. Well, but I enjoyed writing those articles, but I'm glad I don't do it full time. So now you're working on the, what, third, your third season or fourth season of Nurse Jackie? It's actually, uh, it's my, uh, I don't remember what it is, but it's the seventh <laughs> Seventh season it's of the, the show. The final season. Final yeah. season of Nurse Jackie. And then uh, what else are you working on? Uh, for better, for worse, that's it. There you go. So as we like to say in the freelance business, as of tomorrow, I'm unemployed for the rest of my life until something else comes along, but I'm sure it will. Well, I, I hope so. It feels like that. Now, sometime. are you doing any composing just for composing's sake? Are you writing music just because you need to write music? A little bit. Well, I did that concert a year or two ago. That started uh, from music that I had composed for the uh, television show Bored to Death. And I brought together those musicians and supplemented with others. So we kind of had a big group, like 18 people or 15. And I composed a handful of pieces for that group. That right, size. I remember, right. Um, in, in addition to what you'd written for the TV show, since right. you had that group together. And Yeah, oh, that's great. and I had other pieces that had been already written. And then I, you know, had written a handful of other pieces. And uh, I enjoy that quite a bit. But that's a world that, you know, I'm not immersed in any longer. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to put together that 
you know, uh, uh, that many musicians wasn't wasn't a uh, snap. That right. was that was a bit of an undertaking. Fun, and then I did a a, a handful of concerts with a mutual friend of ours. Right with Eleanor Sandresky, right, which has um, been fantastic. Yeah, that was fun, and we recorded mm-hmm. uh, some piano and guitar duets, and um, so yeah, I've been writing other music outside of the television. And you have a handful of CDs of which I have somewhere, or some nice little. I forgot Little about duties. those. Yeah, yeah, that are, those are great. Are yeah. you going to continue? You know, that was sort of a series of. Um, I know. I fell for, yeah. I, I I found. I've got to uh, give you that drum machine back so you can uh, use it on your next one. Nah, it's, it's just sitting dormant in my basement. Well, no, I, I actually I, I bought a replacement. <laughs> I know you said now I feel bad, <laughs> but you do have my guitar, right? Yeah, <laughs> so that's good. That well, maybe makes up for my guilt over taking that well, drum machine back. Don't don't feel guilty, but I I yeah I, I started to write. Um, I love that that the I, music where I would I found an old vintage organ on the street in Long Island City with um, a Yamaha Electone with a great built-in drum machine and I started to just make these CDs based around instruments that I would find right. I, I, and, and you know gradually while I was on the road with the B-52s I would go into thrift stores or pawn shops or and find other instruments, abandoned, discarded things that nobody would want, and make music out of them. But what an Im- what a great impetus to make, you know, an album would be just based on these quirky instruments, and then to try to figure out how to make it work for music. Yeah, it was fun. Well, I, 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 I hope you'll make some more of those because those are great. Oh, thanks. Those I, are great. I'll, I'll give it a go. All right, Pat. Well, thanks for coming to visit. Beautiful. Okay, we'll talk to you soon. See you in a minute. Bye. discover more about Pat Irwin, to buy CDs and see some cool videos of the Ray Beats and Eight-Eyed Spy, go to patirwinmusic.com. Listen for Pat's music on the new season of Nurse Jackie, premiering on Showtime April 12th. For more interviews, info, and links, go to roomtoneradio.com. Remember, an interesting conversation beats talking to yourself. See you next time.